I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Peter Holding. Uh, Peter's a third generation farmer in southeastern New South Wales, growing crops such as uh, wheat and canola, and he runs sheep for wool. Peter is a community outreach officer for Farmers for Climate Action, a group of about 8,000 farmers and representatives who are leading the adoption of climate smart farming solutions and championing strong economy-wide climate policy. Uh, earlier this year in March, FCA released a report titled Farming Forever, a national plan for climate change and agriculture, and found that farmers overwhelmingly want to take action on climate change, but don't quite know where to turn. So uh, Peter, over to you. Uh, well, good evening all, and thanks, Colin, for the invitation. Um, it's good to see we've got such a, a small topic to discussing the intersection of agriculture, global warming, climate action, and success stories and challenges. Not a problem, really. It normally take about six months, but we'll try and get through it tonight, so I'll get started. Um, this will be a very quick and dirty talk with little time spent discussing the many nuances. However, if anyone has questions, Please don't hesitate to get in touch with, with me on the email on the screen down the bottom there of that slide. Uh, FCA was formed as a group of farmers and supporters met in the Blue Mountains in 2016. Um, I served on the board for a few years until I decided that I wanted to have a more hands-on involvement. And that also coincided with a restructure of our farm business to a smaller uh, very much reduced debt and more, more um, intense operation, which allows me to take a role in FCA as an outreach officer. FCA has 8,000 members currently, which makes us one of the bigger uh, advocacy groups. And it has another 30 to 35,000 sort of people who are supporters, but don't identify themselves as farmers. So there's quite a lot of people out there sort of helping us and doing what we we uh, hope to achieve. Now, our role is to advocate for economy-wide emissions reduction as, as our top priority. We also try to provide information and tools to our members and to help the transition to low emission farms. Now, I was asked earlier tonight about what our main sort of philosophy is. Uh, I'll try and explain that a bit. Um, we mostly spend our time working with, with the federal government and we try and um, encourage the uh, Liberal National Conservative governments, be they in states or, or uh, federal, to move to the centre. Um, we think there's enough um, environmental groups pushing from the left. Unfortunately, the way we see, agri uh, see things changing in this country is that if we can't bring the conservatives closer to the left it'll leave a gap in the middle and that'll allow um, other things to happen which may not be advantageous to us either so we've more or less got to work in the devil's cauldron and bring those people like barnaby and the other nutters that are there across so um we're working as hard as we can there are some sensible people on that side of parliament and we're working with those that we think we can help. Uh, feel free to go to the website to get any further information on what we do and how we do it. Um, personally, on our farm, I run farm on Merino sheep, and as the opportunity arises, grow canola and wheat, which up till now we've done every year. Uh, in a climate change world, it's all about reducing management reducing or managing risks. And this is one of the main issues today as we encounter cascading crises that have the potential to put us out of business. And to give you an idea of what I actually do on farm to reduce risk and try to increase productivity, I'll give you the following list. Now, these changes started in 1981 after the drought when I felt that things couldn't go on as they were and had to change. So since then, we've gone to direct drilling and single path sowing with knife points stubble retention for moisture conservation and nutrient retention instead of burning, summer weed control, going to conserve moisture, 
GPS to control traffic and all that sort of thing. Um, on the grazing side, we've gone to time control grazing to keep ground cover and improve soil structure. We've got genetics for improved production and to um, make sure we don't have any non-productive sheep on the farm. And we've identified all animals and their production traits individually. So that allows us to work out which ewes don't lamb and which ones don't produce the right sort of wool. All enterprises are viewed as part of a whole system, not as separate enterprises. So we now grow a lot of um, grazing wheat, grazing cereal. So basically that gives us an opportunity if things don't quite work out. And we plant crops if it's opportune. Now that's only something really recent, but by that I mean if it looks like a drought, we will play it safe and reduce crops. So this year we didn't plant any wheat. Uh, we planted pasture instead because it looks like we're heading into an El Nino and we'll need all the pasture we can get. So what does the future hold and how will we survive climate change and, and to what impact do we think we'll have on our urban customers? Well, I think it's necessary to understand that since World War II, we've lived in an era of rapid agricultural productivity development that has led to cheap and bountiful food. And to varying degrees, this has been the goal of most post-war governments, no matter what their flavour. If the peasants become restless because they can't afford food or can't obtain food, uh, those governments usually end in a problem, witness the Arab Spring and Syria problems, which were mainly driven by food shortages. Now, Australia is no different. And whilst we produce a vast amount of food, which gives our consumers some cushioning, that is now coming under pressure as seen by the rising cost of living and the difficulty with the difficulties with supply chains. Because of our complacency, we have allowed almost all our supply chains to, be, to lengthen between the grower and the consumer and to be monopolised at critical choke points. Examples of this are grain crop controlling the wheat supply chain, meat processors controlling the meat supply, and possibly the biggest one, the retail food du duopoly of Coles and Woolworths controlling our general food supply. Uh, next slide. Now, I just want to run through a couple of slides um, that will give you a bit of an indication of where I see farms sitting at the moment. The first one is on... Um, farm debt, now, don't worry about, just look at the uh, line, the graph, and you can see it's heading upwards and it's uh, gone up about 50% since 2012 to just under a million dollars, the average farm debt is nine. Next slide. Um, this is a slide showing the farm debt again, right going up, and it also shows the gross uh, value of farm production in the blue line. And the important part of this slide is the gross value, uh, sorry, the net value of food production, the green line. And where the bit of a pyramid is, is at the top, which is where we're about now. Incomes have gone up for the last three years because of the good seasons. The red circle indicates where we might be back to again next year. Uh, now, this is just an indication of one of the unfortunate things that can happen in farming, and it also indicates how costs are going up. So you can see in the last couple of years, they've risen dramatically, and this is insurance. And because of the floods and various other national disasters, bushfires and things, insurances have gone up about 30 40% on farming. Mean, in some cases, farmers are no longer able to get insurance, which puts their Really to borrow in a um, serious um, situation. And as we saw from the other slides, their debt's going up. So there's going to be a problem there. Farm business profit. Uh, right. So the important thing here is have a look at the numbers up the top quickly. You go from 2012 to 2022. There's about three years in there where the, where the profits are reasonable, bearing in mind that that's what the family has to live on. The rest of it is a fairly low wage or a low ability to survive. And I, the red dot at the end of the graph is indication of where Abair thought we would get to in the beginning of the year. And I believe it'll be a hell of a lot lower than that. And so I'm very concerned about where we're headed with, uh, with the, you know, 
So that just gives you a rough idea where where the where where I'm seeing farming sitting at the moment. And at the same time, on farms, there's been large demographic demographic and financial changes with the contraction of family farms and the increase of corporate and larger overall farms. I'm not saying this is either good or bad, but these changes do bring other changes that may have an impact down the line. These farms, these larger farms, tend to be driven more by profits than other issues. And when they're no longer profitable, they tend to move to different enterprises or exit existing ones, and that can lead to shortages and, and uh, other issues. One example of this is the um, impact of water trading with uh, large profit farms buying water in traditional irrigation areas and shifting it to non-traditional areas to grow exotic crops like almonds, which probably makes them plenty of money, who knows. But what it does do is um, lower the viability of towns like Griffith and Leeping and the community that lives out there now, which will in the end lead to shortages of staples like fruit and vegetables. Put climate disasters over this and we get a cascading effect in the market. We saw symptom of with the shortages of lettuces when the floods hit. One of the other concerns of broadacre farming is the likelihood of, of diesel shortages in the future. We all remember the Ad Blue shortage that almost brought trucks to a standstill. Without transport, shops, especially food shops, run dry in about a week. We have 21 days of fuel in this country and it won't take much for a shortage or disruption coming out of Singapore to cause us a problem. This is without the uncertainty of transitioning away from diesel to a new energy source for tractors and machinery and the cost, of farm, cost to farms that this will bring. A new header, broadacre tractor, air seeder and a spray will set you back the best part of $2 million. So resale value and changeover to, of redundant machinery will be a major issue. There are likely to be issues in 2030 when, when I expect that climate change will be as getting really quite severe and um, you know, people will be moving away from diesel. So the move, more they move away from diesel, the less supply we will have. And at this point in time, we've had to make connections with um, John Deere and some of the major manufacturers. And even they do not know what direction we're headed in the next few years, whether it's EVs, fuel cells, biodiesel or ammonia. So we can see we've got a few problems there. Um, so what to do? Well, I think the first first thing is, and this is sort of the philosophy of FCA and where we're coming from and, and how we're approaching this. First thing is we need to recognise we're all in this together and that it's happening now. And it's not some future time in some other country. Like too often we, we sort of see things on the news and, you know, Greece is burning down and, and that Canada is burning and India is flooded and all these things happen overseas as they're happening now. And we think that is a must and it won't happen for another 10, 15 or 20 years. Well, I suspect we're about to get a large shock in that regard. Secondly, so we don't um, become too depressed, <laughs> I think we need to have some faith in our fellow travellers. And I'm talking about our our urban cousins here. This is one of the reasons we set up Farmers for Climate Action, because we know that the knowledge of the whole is vastly superior to the knowledge of the individual. So the more people we can get into this discussion from different, um, you know, different views of life and different life experiences, the better chance we're going to come up with a, a, a meaningful change. And thirdly, which I think is important for people to survive this and be resilient, they need hope, but they just, it's not just hope. They need hope, they need a vision, and they need imagination. It's these things that will open up new frontiers, and if we don't have them, don't despair. Find people that do and start working with them for better policies on emission reduction, biodiversity repair, and more equitable, equitable communities. And so as to leave time for questions, I shall finish there. Happy to go into all those issues a lot deeper if anybody is interested. Thanks very much, Peter. That was terrific. I'm sure that's going to inspire many questions. Um, we are um, 
Now we're uh, going to introduce our second speaker, uh, Dr. Kate Burke, um, who is a, uh, an agricultural scientist from Ichuga, Northern Victoria, with her background of a, a PhD in 30 years of consulting to farmers and agribusinesses. Kate has gleaned a broad knowledge of grassroots agronomy, the business of farming, and the science that underpins agriculture. In 2021, the Grains Research and Development Corporation awarded Kate with the Southern Seed of Light Award for her support of grain growers and their endeavours to improve their profitability and sustainability. Uh, Kate blends her um, farming that she has land around Ichuka uh, with her consultancy firm Think Agri, and uh, she is the author of a book titled Crops, People, Money and You, The Arts of Excellent Farming. My hope is to provide you with some hope and some vision and demonstrate some imagination. I really like those three words, thanks, Peter, of what has been happening over the last uh, 20 years in the dryland agriculture space and particularly in relation to, to grains production. So just if we could head back to um, Baldwin for a moment, um, you'll notice I've uh, made a little square here of a house. That's 31 Creek Road with a fantastic, most enchanted backyard back in the 70s where my grandparents lived. And um, my appreciation for the environment and outdoors was not only honed on our home farm, um, 100 miles north just out of Elmore, but over in the Maranoa Gardens and, and in Pop's backyard. And um, I've just got a little circle around. Uh, those of you who are from that region will be very familiar with the very big tower uh, near the car park there and in the playground. Um, when we were kids, we thought that was the biggest tower in the world. And then uh, proudly we would go back as adults and take our families with us to show them the very big tower, only to discover that it wasn't that big after all. And um, much to the um, our chagrin and to the entertainment of our, um, our spouses and, and uh, in-laws. Um, there's nothing like getting married in a drought and getting your wedding photos taken in the bed of an empty lake to um, to bring home um, the impact of climate variability. This photo was taken in 2008. So in 2007, we had Kevin 07, and in 2008, we had Jeff and Kate. But um, I guess the point of that rather self-indulgent photo is to demonstrate that this isn't new news. This has, we have been getting warmer, hotter, drier, and more variable, particularly for the last 20 years. And the um, IPCC data that comes out uses 1990 as, as the benchmark. And by the time this came into our consciousness during the 2000s in the middle of the millennial drought, I recall um, uh, being invited to a, a workshop to understand about what might happen with, with um, climate change and global warming and to look at, at the various um, scenarios and also to look at where we were then. And I recall them saying, you know, it, we expect that in 2030, blah, blah, blah will happen. And I went home that night and did some calculations and at Birchip and at Horsham, where I was residing at the time, we were already there because we'd been in this period of extensive drought. And then, of course, it came good for a while and we got the very the um, extremes of the 2010 era. And again, in 2016, then we had a very severe drought in the west east coast, and then again we had the the flood extremes of the last couple of years. So I guess um, while it's not new news, what it does demonstrate is that we understand more now, and we continue 
to learn and to adapt. And we had some terrific research done in that um, period um, of the, the Labor government, like the federal Labor government uh, from sort of 2008 until they were deposed. And uh, unfortunately then um, there was basically all of that work was just put on ice until, until more recently. But some of the things that, that we've learnt, for example, this is what I call climate moods. So the, what we had last year was a combination of La Nina and Indian Ocean Dipole negative. And those sort of years are the years where we get wet, cool conditions and proneness to floods. On the other hand, what I call Group F years for obvious reasons are um, when we get El Nino and IOD positive together, and that's when you get that very dry and hot uh, conditions. And we can use this sort of data to inform what might be coming up and, and to have some foresight and then develop some flexibility. And you know, my vision would be for this data to be used right across the board for natural resources management, natural disasters, preempting, as, as well as agriculture, because it's a really powerful, very simple tool. Unfortunately, in 2019, when we had those dreadful bushfires, Blind Freddy except the powers that be could see that we we're at high risk. And yet it seemed to be a surprise for one and all. So going back to 2007, and, and um, this is for your benefit, Kyle, I had to make a reference to growing fodder and, and hay. Um, I was involved in some research way back then about how we could um, adjust to to um, climate shocks and convert things like canola that would normally go to grain and then end up in margarine, how we could turn that into fodder. And the end result was that in times of um, severe fodder shortage, um, cows can, can eat uh, hay made out of canola. And the other side of that is the farmers who um, because of a, a frost or a heat event, normally wouldn't get any grain. By conserving the biomass of that crop, they can actually get an income from it. So that's an example of the adaptability that already exists and has been in existence for 16 years. So I guess my main message is that climate resilient farms are profitable farms because the same things that help with climate resilience are the, are the things that drive profit. And that's essentially productivity and risk management. And I just slid this slide in while Peter was talking um, in response to the data shown from, from the Bureau data. One thing to be aware of about those massive data sets is that generally, there is a huge variation within a data set. So you may have an average, but most of the data sets I've looked at, the upper performing farms tend to be twice as profitable as the, as the average um, of, of each data set. And what that tells me is that if climate resilience farm, farms are profitable farms, and there's an opportunity to improve profitability shown by that, that gap there, then there's a, a, an opportunity to improve climate resilience of, of our farming systems. So one of the problems we have in this world of social media and division, and you know, I guess the Trump effect is, is um, everything's looked at from a dualistic point of view. And unfortunately, things aren't looked at enough as being both being possible. And it is possible to have productive and sustainable landscapes because we've learned already in agriculture that if you're highly productive but unsustainable, you get the gold for a while and then, then it all unravels. If you're unproductive and unsustainable, well, they're usually the farms that get sold onto somebody else. And unfortunately, they're also the farms that get photographed during drought. There's also um, one of the unintended consequences of, of um, some environmental movements is that we can have green farm, farms that are actually lean in terms of their product, 
productivity. So they're sustainable, but not that productive and not that profitable. And then I guess the purple patch and, and um, the type of agriculture that, that I'm supportive of and practice myself is where productivity and sustainability occur hand in hand. That said, so hopefully I've demonstrated that, um, you know, we are continually adapting, but what about emissions reduction on farms and, and what about carbon sequestration? Peter's already said that farming's nuanced, complex, and, it, and it's sophisticated. And one thing I just wanted to point out is that soil carbon has been, of the, the previous government talked about soil carbon being one of the main underpinning strategies for, for climate change mitigation. The trouble is that soil carbon in Australia has, has a very limited scope because soil carbon influences include soil type, then climate, then farm type, then farm management. So ultimately we're too dry and in a lot of the time too hot to make a real difference for um, soil carbon compared to other parts of the world. Although we can make some small differences. What's positive though is the next generation are curious and are really driving change. And going back to that, that's what makes me believe that, you know, they will lead us to productive and sustainable um, farming systems. And I guess the last um, point, though, is despite what you hear and what you see and what you read, carbon sequestration on farm won't absolve you from your emission sins. And that's where we are in all, all in this together and need to turn our lights off and our air conditioners down. That's it from me. Thank you, Kate. Our final speaker from our country cousins and, and um, introduced Jodie Hay. She and her husband, Colin, and uh, son, Tom, farm about 1,100 um, hectares in Northern Victoria, Kahuna, uh, including 950 hectares, which is uh, irrigated country. Uh, here they farm um, 400 dairy cows and a cropping enterprise which uh, grows feed for their for their um, hang hungry dairy cows. As a fifth generation Australian farmer, Jody has particular interest in biodiversity and sustainable farming practices, uh, which she uh, she matches in with her own best farming practices. So uh, thank you for your presentation, Jody. Uh, you said, Cole, we farm here in Northern Victoria um, on Yorta Yorta country. Um, and we um, run a dairy farm. So we have had enormous changes in the time that I've been farming here on this farm. Um, I've, I've been here now 30 years. Um, so my husband and I actually took over management of the farm 20 years ago, which was actually the beginning of the millennium drought. So as um, Kate and Pete have said, nothing teaches you more about um, climate than, than a drought and, and how you have to adapt. And I think, um, you know, out of adversity comes opportunity. And I think some of our biggest learnings came in that drought. You know, historically, we ran a, um, an irrigation farm, which we irrigated permanent pasture, you know, 300 acres. We ran 200 cows, um, which meant we, we irrigated um, that pasture all year. Um, then, you know, introduced the millennium drought, we lost our water security, um, you know, in a combination between drought and, and some changes in water policy, Murray-Darling Basin Plan, those sorts of things. We've had enormous challenges and changes in the way we farm. So uh, we could no longer rely on our water as being our um, safety net. So we had to really change our, our farming practices. Um, so by doing that, we, we changed from perennial pastures, uh, which was pasture that grew basically all year to annuals, which, um, you, you know, we were able to produce more feed at different times of the year using sort of more of the natural rainfall um, and, and a lot less water and growing, you know, being able to grow the same amount of feed. Um, so that was sort of, you know, one of the practices that we were forced into, but it actually was one of our best teachers. The drought was actually one of our best teachers and, uh, you know, we were able to adapt and, and change our farming system to, to be able to be flexible. Um, 
So um, with our dairy, we now have um, our cows graze really basically between um, March and November while the pastures are growing because we now grow uh, winter and spring active um, grasses as opposed to those that grew in the summer. Um, and so our cows are in the paddocks grazing most of that time unless the weather is um, not conducive to that. Like if it's too wet, then we have a barn, which you'll see photos of later. Um, so our cows are housed over the summer uh, as there's no pasture being grown at that time and we feed them on a, um, on a feed pad, which is a concrete area on our dairy yard. And that um, allows us to feed them the feed that we've conserved in, in, the, um, in the autumn and, or in the spring that's been grown over the autumn and the winter. Um, calf rearing, we, we do uh, rear all our replacements, which is our, the, the girl calves that um, we enter the, the dairy herd at two years old. Um, we spend our whole time making sure that all of our cows and our calves uh, are well looked after. They often get more rest, food and shelter than us. We're usually out there in the, <laughs> in the elements making sure they're all okay. Um, we have a 40 unit rotary dairy that you can see a photo of there. Um, so the cows are milked twice a day um, and they produce around about nine and a half thousand litres uh, each. So they're pretty amazing machines and they're great converters. Um, so, you know, one of my big spiels with our um, dairy and, and the climate and environment is that I really think we've moved a little bit away. Well, there seems to be a thing that you can't have farming and the environment together. Um, and I'm, I'm a really big, big advocate for sort of making sure that people understand that just because we run a primary production um, system doesn't mean that we don't, you know, provide habitat um, for native, you know, species. Um, and I think that's really important. So that one there is our, um, our big compost barn. Now that was built in 2017 and we built that um, just so that we could provide, well, it was initially designed to help us out with wet winters so that we didn't have to put our cows out in the pasture uh, if it was too wet. However, it's providing, it's proving to be as beneficial in the summer um, and probably more beneficial in the summer actually because it reduces the, the heat stress on our cows by about 10 degrees, so it can be 45 degrees outside and, and 35 under that dairy, under that um, loafing barn. It has a compost floor, which is made out of um, the manure from our cows, and so that's composted and, and turned daily to make sure that it you know, provides a really safe, uh, hygienic and soft bedding for the cows, and, and that is proving to be you know, a, 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 an amazing asset for our um, our business. It's allowed us flexibility. If, if, if it's wet, we can put the cows in there and save them pugging our pastures. Um, and, and when it's hot, it provides shelter for our cows. We do have lots and lots of trees planted on our farm. However, our cows, if given, and they are given the choice, um, if they're in a paddock, even with, cheap, with trees, if it gets to 28 degrees, they will choose to come and hang out in this um, in this compost barn. So that's kind of heartening for us to make sure that our cows are choosing where they, where they hang out and they are hanging out there because it's the most comfortable, it's the coolest and it's got the softest floor. So, um, uh, so that, that's our feed pad there. So that's where we feed our cattle their conserved mix. So we have a nutritionist come in and make up a diet for our cows to make sure that they're producing, you know, at, at their highest capacity. and, and if we think about, you know, um, making sure that we're doing our best for, you know, for making sure we're producing food as efficiently as we can, um, you know, cows are a little bit demonised for their methane production as, as far as carbon emissions. And, um, you know, we need to make our cows the most, you know, productive they can be, um, you know, so that we, we optimise, you know, their efficiency. And so if one cow is producing more milk, but 
and, and the same amount as in a, you know, and producing the same amount of methane as one that's not producing that amount of milk. I think you know there's some real efficiencies to be gained there. So we need to you know we make sure that we we breed um, really high producing cows. So this is um, just some of the things that we do on our farm to make sure that we are a, as profitable as we can be. And I, and I like Kate's analogy there that, you know, I think successful, profitable farms, they have to be sustainable. Therefore, you know, we have to acknowledge all of the things that are um, working for and against us. Uh, so in our system here, you're seeing on uh, one screen there, there's some water running out of a looks kind of grimy kind of water running onto our yard. That's actually reused water. So all of the water that goes on to feed to washing our dairy yard, which happens twice a day, uh, and the feed pad, because they're the one, the one article, it's um, that water is reused. It's, it's collected in an effluent dam system. Um, so the all the solids and the, and the liquid go into one dam and then it runs into a liquid dam, which allows us to reuse that water over and over again. Um, so that, that's a real saving for us. And um, we also reuse all of our water that we irrigate with. Um, so all of the water that runs onto our, that, that is irrigated onto our paddocks also has the um, option of being collected and then reused again. So, you know, that's that another learning from the drought. You know, water is really precious and we really value every drop uh, and therefore we make sure that we, we utilise every drop. Uh, that effluent there is, once it's in that liquid dam, has the option of being put into onto our paddocks via our irrigation system. Um, so that, you know, is a, is a real bonus because it saves on us having to use synthetic fertilisers such as urea. I mean, we still do use that, but this really reduces, um, the, you know, our need for lots of urea. So they're things we're working towards, um, uh, you know, implementing on our on our farm. The dam next door just shows you all of, it's an actual dam, a freshwater dam that the water's collected off that big compost barn and our big dairy roof. Um, and they're ducks that you can see. They're probably a little bit tiny there, but, you know, I think it's really important to highlight that our um, primary production land is actually home to, you know, to hundreds of species. We've actually had an agricultural department of ag um, come out and do a couple of bird counts on our farm. And there was 57 varieties of, of species of birds identified, only five were introduced. And we can probably add another 20 that, or 20 odd that I've seen, you know, that, that weren't on those their particular days. So 80 species of birds, and they're not there because I've got them caged there. They are there just because there's an ecosystem that supports them. So I think we, you know, that really highlights that dual purpose water. You know, when we put on irrigated land, um, you know, there's there's a whole lot of biodiversity. And I think it's really important that we stress that, you know, just because you've got primary production doesn't mean that you haven't got uh, the ability to really enhance biodiversity and, and provide habitats for, for, for lots of native species, um, whilst also you know, producing amazing Australian um, milk. Uh, so that's part of our waste management. This is the other part of that, our nutrient recycling. So out of that, F, uh, the, the solids effluent dam, we can collect twice a year um, the manure and we put it into big stockpiles and then we use a company to um, turn this into our compost. So it just it speeds up the process. And these are things that we've implemented in the last couple of years. Um, so that allows us to use that effluent and turn it into an amazing compost. And I think last year we put out around about 1,700 tonne of, um, of composted manure. And so that's a huge savings in having to use synthetic fertilisers. You know, it makes a much less of cost for our business. And it also adds really important organic matter into our soil, which is, you know, something we're really working hard um, on our farm to do is to improve our soil structure um, so that we, you know, we, we're trying to implement some more regenerative ag practices where we keep more pasture um, on, our, on our soil all the time. We really try to avoid having um, soil that's exposed or doesn't have any any grasses on it. So they're things that we've changed in our management um, you know, as we as we 
sort of head into this this new era you know it's this lifelong learning um, what you've done 10 years ago is you know not what we're going to be doing in 10 years time so I think you know that's another thing that as farmers we're really really aware that we just have to keep moving and acknowledging all the new things that are available to us the new pressures and and the new opportunities I think there's some real exciting opportunities um, as we move forward in this space our energy management um, it was really interesting when Cole asked me to sort of identify this I was kind of a bit amazed at how many things we actually do <laughs> and we've been doing them for quite a long time so some of them are new and some of them have been practices that dairy farmers have done for a long time on our um, two sheds we've got 100 kilowatt uh, solar systems uh, which have been you know they were put in five years one was put in five years ago and the other one was put in last year so we've seen enormous um, improvements in our energy use and that's been really good on the money side of things but also really great that we we're now you know contributing uh, our energy requirements and, and being able to use them with a renewable energy source I, those two um, systems they generate around on average around about 30, 430 kilowatts uh, of, of power every day. Um, and that, that can average in the summer, you know, around 800 and then get down to as low as 300 kilowatts. So these are the, the plate cooler is um, something that is used to cool our milk because as it comes out of the cow, it's 37 degrees and we need to get into our vat, um, which is where it's cooled. And so we, with the milk going through a plate cooler, which is a series of little silver plates and water goes, cool water goes through one side of the plate and the milk goes through the other. So that'll cool the milk down from around about 37 degrees to anywhere between 18 and 22 um, in the vat. And then the vat has to do the work to cool it down to uh, four degrees as that's what's required for us to store our milk at. Uh, the big tower there, that's a cooling tower and that actually cools the water that goes into the cooling, the plate cooler. So um, the water's pumped up, runs down that big silver tank uh, and into a recycled trough and, and it cools it down. So we cool the water before we cool the milk. Um, and then the other structure you can see there is an evacuated hot water system. We, we did an energy audit and worked out that we um, spend most of our power was used for heating water. So we now have a an evacuated hot water service, which sits on our roof, um, heats up the pipes, and then the waters that goes into our hot water service to be heated um, is already hot from the sun. So that is a new addition this year. So, uh, and it seems to be doing a really great job. It's halved the time that it's cost, that it's taking to heat our water. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah, these are our different irrigation systems. Um, water, is our world really here? Um, we're irrigation farmers. Uh, we've had some enormous challenges and changes with the Murray Darling Basin Plan, um, and, and and of course the Millennium Drought, and just our water reliability is um, is a little bit more you know uh, dubious than what it what it was. So we've had to come up with you know different strategies, uh, and we've got different irrigation systems as well. We've got flood irrigation, which is based on gravity. Uh, and then we've got some center pivots, which use a lot less water, but they also require power. So we've got to balance up, you know, which of the two evils <laughs> we, we use. But, you know, irrigation is, is an exciting and amazing um, tool. We, you know, we've got to be really grateful that we've got it. Uh, the magic of gravity, I always say, you know, our forefathers who thought of, you know, capturing it where it rains and, and allowing it to use gravity to, to run into a natural floodplain uh, to, to make it, you know, some of the most productive ground, you know, productive a lot of the time is, um, is a pretty amazing, amazing feat. And I'm, I'm forever grateful for, the, for that. And I think Kate picked up on that really important thing that, if we're going to be able to sequester carbon, you know, water is a really important part of that. Um, so we we really value our water. We've been able to, um, you know, we we did run 300 acres on and use around about a thousand megs 20 years ago. Fast forward to now, we're now farming two and a half thousand acres, and and we use a similar amount of water. So 
I guess that that shows you how we've been able to adapt um, and learn and and change, you know, with with the different things that are thrown at us. So, you know, I think farmers are pretty good at that and, and we've got to be able to keep learning just to, to be able to keep, you know, keep producing and, um, you know, make sure that we we do the best we can with what we have. Yeah, now this, this map here is a really exciting one for me. I love it. Um, we've just started working with the, the Murray-Darling Wetland Working Group, which is a, a group that um, they're an environmental group. And this is a map showing the, the, com the vegetation communities that existed on our farm um, prior to us being here. So it's what would have been here before we, we came along and started farming it. So if you see that big pink area, um, that is, is a treeless plain. So that was a, a chenipa, you know, grassland. Uh, and, and then you can see those little areas that were wetlands and then some of them were the chenipod woodlands, which would have had, you know, our box trees. So what we're aiming to do is, is uh, and this is it, whilst we've always planted trees and, you know, they've been really important in our, in our farming history, we're now sort of looking at this, you know, in the next phase of what we're doing to, to plan, you know, how we're going to be, um, move forward, you know, what parts of our farm we're going to continue to plant out, some of that we're going to re, um, uh, we, we're going to stop farming it as such and, and allow it to go back to how it was naturally, some of those um, grasslands and, and woodlands. So that's a kind of exciting next chapter in our, in our farming journey. Um, what we're going to continue, obviously, farming, but we're going to be really respectful of what was there and, you know, and how in our best capabilities can we allow some of that to go back to its, its natural state. Um, you know, and, and in doing that, we think that'll really enhance our, our farming um, business because if you add you know, more biodiversity, then you, you, know, you, you get more bird life, you get, you know, and that interacts with, you can perhaps use less pesticide. Um, because you've got these birds doing these jobs for you. So you start to get that ecosystem, you know, really working. So that's that's the exciting new chapter in our farming um, as we move forward. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to doing some work with that, the Murray-Darling Wetland Group and using those authorities and their expertise in teaching us what we need to do next. Uh, that's our, just our natural vegetation. So there's some of the areas that we're, we're talking about with your, your chenopod woodlands and your chenopod grasslands. Um, we often think that, you know, our whole area was covered in trees and we took them all down, which we, we did um, in some spots, but there was obviously some, some areas that were naturally treeless and, you know, it's probably, it's important for those species that existed there that we, we leave them like that and, um, you know, and we're, we're sort of quite committed to, to allowing some of that to, to be, you know, untouched on our farm again. So it's, it's a nice position to be in. And there's just some of the pictures of the biodiversity, like, you know, at times there's, there's thousands of birds, um, you know, hanging out at our place, which is beautiful. Uh, and they're obviously doing some important work there as well. The ibis are pretty good at keeping our insects down and, and saving us using pesticides and those sorts of things. And, and that's not saying we don't. There's time to time we still use synthetic fertilisers. We are conventional farmers um, and pesticides. But if we can start to bring in practices that, you know, allow us not to have to do that, you know, that's definitely where we're heading. If that's just sustainable. I mean, to be sustainable, you know, we, we have to continue to do that. We have to listen to our consumers and they're, and they're, they're asking questions and, and I welcome the scrutiny. And I think, you know, if we can keep lines of communication open, they'll teach us, we can teach them. And, you know, I, I sort of grab any opportunity to, to keep those lines of communication open because, it's important, um, food production's important, keeping local food production's really important. Um, you know, if we can keep down how, how far, you know, food has to be transported. Yes, I'm really proud that we, we produce enough food to send it overseas. Um, however, I think, you know, with what's happened with our dairy industry, you know, I think 20 years ago, there was 22,000 dairy farmers. We're now under 4,500 in the whole of Australia. So um, I don't see many environmental benefits of, of bringing a produce like milk um, from overseas. So I think it's really important that we, we, we forge a way forward where agriculture, food production and, um, you know, being climate 
climate sensitive and environmentally sensitive, you know, if we can do those things together, I, I, I think we've got an exciting little journey. Fantastic, Kate. Thank you so much. Uh, the first question uh, is from David um, in relation to um, genetically modified um, cropping, crops. And in particular, I think Kate mentioned canola and David's wondering, uh, does Kate grow genetically modified canola? And uh, does Kate use glyphosate herbicides, you know, with the, with the view to, uh, I guess, farming as naturally as possible? Uh, what are the opinions uh, uh, about uh, that sort of question? Yeah, ha happy to have a go at, at that. Thank, thanks, Ray. And I guess uh, I did preempt this question, so I might just share my screen again if I can, and um, I shall. Uh, I just want to show you a little video um, of why we use glyphosate in our farming systems. So this, this paddock here, so you can see the dust coming across this particular paddock. This is a paddock in the northern Mallee and um, the fact that there's so much soil cover and, and straw covering that soil is really significant because 20 years ago you wouldn't have had that because people were cultivating, they would tended to cultivate their, their paddocks to control weeds, particularly in the off season. What glyphosate allows us to do is to spray the weeds so that we can keep that ground cover rather than digging it up. And um, that particular paddock was getting blown over the dirt blowing over it was coming from the neighbouring farm that wasn't using glyphosate and was controlling its weeds by cultivation. So um, basically for us to enjoy the amount of um, ground cover and re soil erosion reduction that we've had over the last 20 years, glyphosate's an essential part of that. And herbicide tolerant canola is also part of that um, jigsaw. Not all herbicide tolerant canola is genetically modified. Um, the glyphosate tolerant canola is genetically modified, but there are other herbicides that, that we use and, and those herbicide tolerant traits are, are bred through conventional plant breeding means. Um, we have it, my farm, we, we've only had it for four years um, and we have just used conventionally bred herbicide tolerant um, traits. Um, but it's certainly, and, and um, there's some comments there about using things like crimpers rather than using glyphosate at a broad scale across, um, you know, large acreages, things like crimpers just aren't economically viable for, for um, broad scale agriculture. So these chemicals play an enormous part. And if you took those chemicals away, those of you that are old enough will remember the day the dust all came to Melbourne in 1983. We'd be going back to that. And we don't want to go back to that. Thanks, Kate. Um, I think we could have a, a quite a, a, a big discussion around that one topic. Uh, <laughs> But, but we, I guess we, it's really important that we give everyone a chance to have their questions asked as, as best we can. So I'll hand over to Lynn for the next question. Great, thanks, Ray. Um, so we've got a question here from Michelle Smith. Um, could you comment on farmers' engagement with carbon markets? And I think this is also related to further questions we've had about soil carbon and the ability sequester carbon in the soil. Um, I think, Kate, you were quite dismissive of it being a, um, a main contributor to drawdown here in Australia. Um, so just interested if you have any further comment. Yeah, yeah. And, and I want to temper, I suppose, um, temper, I guess, that dismissiveness. Um, 
I'm not saying that we can't sequester carbon in Australia. We can and, and we are. And we've certainly, since changing our practices from cultivation to retaining ground cover and minimising cultivation and minimising burning, we've practically doubled our um, carbon in, in our very moderate carbon soil. So we've gone from, you know, point back in the 90s in in um, some soil types from about 0.8 and 0.9 percent um, organic carbon to well over two percent. I guess what I was saying is we don't have the seven percent soil carbon soils that they do have in the northern states of North America. So when we hear these grand stories on documentaries about um, what can happen in certain environments, we don't have that environment. So I'm not saying we can't do it. It's just a very, each environment has its own um, ability. And I guess a saying I wrote in a Guardian article um, last year was that you can't turn sand into peat moss. Um, so, so that's what I mean by that. And what was the beginning of the question, sorry? At the beginning of the question was, um, do you have any comments on, oh, on engagement yep, yep, with yep. carbon markets? Yep. So there's interest. Most of the uptake in carbon markets at the moment has been in the more pastoral zones of Australia um, and, and taken up by, I guess, more entrepreneurial types than what I would call bread and butter, mum and dad farmers um, down, down in the uh, southern parts of, of, of the country. And um, one of the reasons there hasn't been a lot of uptake is that we know that we're going to need the carbon to um, offset our, our own emissions before we sell it um, to anybody else to offset their emissions. And given those comments I made about the impact of rain on carbon, the worst thing that could happen would be to sell, lock into a 25 year deal on carbon. And then at the end, and you'd start now where your carbon levels are reasonable because we've had three wet years, then the end of your 25 years, you come across another millennial drought and the carbon stocks have declined just purely because of rainfall, not because of your practices. So there's a whole lot of nuance there that carbon markets at the moment, the demand is ahead of the supply and that's the problem we've got. Okay, thank you. Back to Ray for another question. Uh, okay, this one's from Richie. Um, and we know that nitrous oxide is a greenhouse gas and gas and nitrate fertilizers contribute, uh, in my understanding anyway, to that. And Richie wonders um, how we're going with replacing nitrate fertilizers with uh, legumes and green manure crops. Do you want me to have another go at this as well? <laughs> or do you want to have a go, Peter? Um, yeah, look, we've been growing various crops, legumes like lupins and fava beans and, you know, lots of clover. And I, I basically most of my pastures now are high density legumes. So that's white clovers, sub clovers, loosen, the whole mix all put together. Um, and that works. Um, problem with it is that it, you've got to... Um, meet some protein requirements, which can be a bit difficult at times. But the, the big difference I think we need to understand is that um, Australian farmers don't use anywhere near the amount of nitrogen that you see being used overseas. And that's basically because we're not subsidised. You know, we're seeing stories about, um, you know, New Zealand's got a problem with its dairy industry that I unpolitely suggest they stole from us, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> And so now they've got to deal with it. But um, it's basically because they're in intensive industries applying manure and everything to small areas and it overloads the, the soil and it runs into the rivers and it causes them the usual pollution problem, which we've known about for years and is not acceptable. So, you know, out here, I don't think farmers um, use an, an acceptable amount. I would suspect this year they'll use even less because of the possibility of a dry finish. Um, so yeah, we we we, you know, farmers are generally trying to cut costs, and 
urea was worth fifteen hundred dollars a ton last year so mm. if we can find another way of doing it we will um the big problem is though and, and it's the same problem with a lot of these issues is that if you cut the urea you cut the yield and you know i think in australia we need to realize that uh, the wheat market has jumped about 20 dollars a ton in the last week because of the shortage of supplies that is starting to show up india has banned the export of rice because they're running out of rice and they're 40 percent of the rice market so there's going to be a big shortage of cereal, cereal grains and if we start cutting our yields back then it's not going to be the wealthy people that suffer it's going to be all the the poorer people and i think the clearest example of that is going to be uh, what happens in the future with caged eggs now we all want to get away from caged eggs i haven't got a problem with that but about half our half our egg use in australia is from caged eggs and if we get rid of them and we can't replace them somehow then a whole lot of people and a whole lot of manufacturing thing like eggs go into a lot of manufactured food so that's going to drive up the price of that and so what you're going to find is it's not going to make a scrap of difference to myself or to um, you know the, the average person that's got a decent job but anybody that's finding uh, the cost of living difficult at the moment is going to find it extremely difficult and I think that's a uh, something that we need to think about how we balance those two competing um, outcomes yeah yeah, thanks very much, Peter. And Kate, did you want to answer that question as well? Yeah, I've got a couple of points to make. Um, and and basically, uh, the for for croppers and 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 mixed farmers, the crop rotation or the sequence of crops that you have in a field is is designed to do a number of things. One, it's designed to provide diversity. It's like a share portfolio. So you have your, I suppose, your blue chip crops that um, yield very well and, and are, are quite um, stable in their production despite, you know, right, like despite what climate throws at it. And then you have your um, sort of high risk, high return crops. And then you also have crops that are, are there for a particular function. So they might be crops to fix nitrogen, for example, or to provide a disease break. So that whole issue of trying to develop fertilizer on the farm or nitrogen on the farm is part of the mix. The reality is though, every year, depending on how much rainfall we get, our potential production is governed by the amount of rainfall received and the amount of water stored in the soil. And as I mentioned before, every year is different. So some years we need to capture that potential yield, which then converts into income, A, to do two things, to feed the population and to B, um, make a profit and feed ourselves. And, and that requires extra fertilizer to do that because nitrogen basically drives um, plant biomass and it, it's food for the plant. You can't grow a plant without nitrogen. You can't grow it without phosphorus. So in, in um, favorable years, we need to feed the crops. And then in dry years, we, we don't feed them as much because we haven't got the same yield potential. So it's it's um again I'll just share share my screen. There's a quote here from a an eminent scientist from Melbourne University that says concentrating on parts of the system without understanding the impact on the whole system may not make the farmer more money or provide a better life. And I think you could take out may not make the um the country more money or provide a better life. And in fact, it can do quite the opposite. And here's an example where on our, our soils are very, very naturally low in fertility. So here's an example where phosphorus was missed when planting the canola and some nitrogen compared to the normal rate of, of phosphorus. 
And if you look at the, for one hectare of soil, the profit made from that paddock um, was, um, had a difference of roughly around $1,500 per one hectare. So for every two and a half acres. So that's an enormous amount of money. So if, if it was um, legislated, for example, that we had to reduce our phosphorus um, output, oh, sorry, or, or consumption, it would have enormous um, enormous implications for the amount of um, food that was produced in this country. Great, thank you. Um, so this is a question initially for Jody, and then perhaps the others might have something to say. Um, look, we hear a lot about um, seaweed and, um, and mixed into feed and the difference it can make for the methane emissions from cows. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit about that. Um, and then there was another question in the chat which asked um, kind of what percentage of farmers out there are trying to do the same sorts of things that you're doing, Jody? How common is it in the area where you live? And I wonder if the others could also answer that question. Yeah, um, on the seaweed, that, that's sort of just an, an, an emerging, they're still doing work on that and it does look promising. However, um, we use a, a, you know, a, an additive to our feed. Uh, it's, a, it's called Romancin, which is a, um, a, a sort of a gut health um, product. We use it just to stop bloat, which your cows can get sometimes if they eat the wrong grass and it just makes them more efficient. Um, and that actually, there's some science, uh, there's some studies done on that. I think the name was Grua um, in 2006. And it sort of said that even by adding that, you can... Um, reduce methane uh, emissions, but anywhere between between 25 and 37 percent. So um, I stumbled upon that the other day, and I hadn't actually heard. I knew that Romance did lots of other things for us, uh, you know, as dairy farmers, uh, not people, because you have to have four stomachs to eat it. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, and I thought, well, that that's something that's not really advocated for. So I, that was just something I I, I came across. But um, yeah, the, the seaweed is certainly something we we're looking at, and and I guess as dairy farmers who feed their cows every day, we're really in an op opportune situation there um, where every cow, you know, we can supplement um, seaweed into the diet easily as opposed to those that have, you know, got grazing systems over, you know, thousands of acres like, you know, some of the ones up north. So I feel that, you know, the way we farm, um, you know, seaweed could definitely be easily easily added. So as soon as it's available, um, you know, of course, we, we're going to be onto those sorts of things. Um, and as far as, um, you know, our farmers in our area, you, basically, we have to have a healthy environment, you know, to, to be sustainable. So, um, you know, we all understand that and, and work as hard as we can. You know, there is some really exciting people around our area that are doing amazing, um, amazing things with their farms. You know, I, I'd love the platform to, to share it more. Um, you know, there's there's a guy that's been planting trees and and you know re-establishing wetlands on his farm for I don't know 40 years and it you know it's in, it's insane uh, when you go there it's an exciting it's a you know a working farm but it's also just the most beautiful environment um, and he's also working with the the Murray Darling Wetland Working Group um, and and they're doing some amazing things together so uh, yeah it is really common you know there's been tree groups and all sorts of things in our area my mum was one of the um, the founders of, of, of one of those groups, and that was 40 years ago. So it's not new. Um, you know, here in, in northern Victoria, where I am, we had lots of salinity problems, um, and that was from irrigation, overusing irrigation, um, you know, pulling out trees, all those sorts of things. And that was in the 70s and 80s. Um, so we're really, really cautious, and we know how, how sensitive and how how um, careful we have to be with our soil, because without healthy soil, you know, we, we can't do what we do. So yeah, it's um, it's pretty widespread. Thank you for that. Um, Kate or Peter, do you have any sense of the farms around you, whether you think people are adopting regenerative agriculture and more progressive practices? Uh, look, that's that's most definitely what's happening. Um, I, I find it interesting. I, I can't remember the name of the movie, but there was a regen farming movie made in America about regenerative farming, Kiss the Earth, I think it might have been. Yep. And when you watch that movie, 
that is almost what we do on a regular basis across broadacre mixed farms in Australia. Like we rotate crops, we rotate grazing. We don't use anywhere near the fertiliser and chemicals. I don't use um, insecticides on my farm at all. Uh, and it's not really necessary once you bed the system down. It does take time to do that. But, you know, at, at the as yet, I still use fertiliser because I can't get away from... Um, um, I can't accept the yield reduction that occurs if, if I don't use it. But we are trying to rotate more. So, yeah, I think everybody's doing that. Many, Most of the farms I know would not set stock anymore. That that went out about maybe 20 years ago. Uh, most of them are using a... Oh, some don't use as time control grazing um, the intensity that, that can be used. It's more of a, a weekly or fortnightly shift. But... Um, you know, it it just depends on on your on your structure. I think one of the things that's been forgotten in this discussion tonight is that um, debt levels on farms quite often drive what happens on the farm rather than what the farmer would like to see what happens on the farm. And you know how we solve that problem, I do not know. I think there's a land we've we've allowed ourselves to um, be sucked into it both in the cities and in the country where we, we just keep uh, this neoliberal idea of increasing land values. And I think that's great. And you pump money into the system and it causes asset bubbles, but it can't go on forever. And that is gonna to come to a shock, a shocking end. And um, I suspect we're getting close to it. So, you know, when, when everybody jumps up and down about farmers doing this out and the other, you've got to remember that we're standing behind many farmers is a bank manager telling him, do it or leave. So I think that's an, an, an issue that we've got to have a long, hard think about. Um, I could probably yeah, add in there. You know, I, do, I think it's really important to, to acknowledge that, um, I know in our area, like, um, 86% of the land is owned by, you know, is privately owned land. So I think if we're going to, you know, move forward and um, have, you know, great environmental outcomes, then we have to, we have to join forces. Um, you know, we, we have, it, it makes sense to, to work with, with farmers. Hmm. One, of, one of the great things I think of land care, of, you know, over the years uh, is that it actually taught farmers how to look at, landscape scale change rather than just scale on their own farms. I think that's, that is something that's, uh, we're now seeing the benefit of in regional sort of developments. Can There's I some exciting projects here happening where um, they're, they're looking across, you know, as you say, landscapes and, and trying to, you know, uh, have an overall picture of, you know, having wildlife corridors go, you know, not just on one farm, but connecting, you know, icon sites such as creeks back to swamps and um, all those sorts of things. So, you know, I, I think if we move in those directions, it's going to be pretty in, well. With. In fact, Jody, there's a, um, a wildlife corridor that was planted about 20 years ago that follows the old railway line all the way from Kahuna through to Elmore including going part through our, our property. And for those that don't realise, that's about a 50-kilometre journey. Um, I just wanted to make a quick comment about regenerative agriculture and the US and Australian baseline. Um, two main practices in regenerative agriculture, one being cell grazing of livestock and the other being um, reduced cultivation or, or no tillage. Um, cell grazing of livestock has been around in Australia since I was at uni. So that's a long time ago. That's, you know, 35 years ago. Um, and, and it is best practice and has been best practice in, in really good um, uh, livestock grazing systems for a long time. In the US, a survey done a few years ago of... Um, who, how many farmers were cultivating their paddocks. It was 60% of the farmers were using cultivation and leaving their soil exposed to erosion and reducing organic matter. In Australia, that same, a similar survey, only 20% of Australian farmers were cultivating their soils. So we, we're already at 
the level that is being promoted by a lot of um, the stories around regenerative agriculture. It's, it's not new here. Um, regenerative organic agriculture is, is a different level again, and that's taking out some of the fertiliser and some of the chemicals out of the system. But it's really important to understand that we're not the US and they're, we're so further ahead on the journey of, re regener of regenerative or conservation agriculture, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's not funny. So I think it's really important to understand that. Thank you to, to Kate, Dr. Kate Burke. Thank you to Peter Holding from Farmers for Climate Action. And thank you to Jody Hay up there in uh, dairy country, inspirational stuff going on up there. So look, I think uh, it's, it doesn't happen often enough where the folks in the country and the folks in the towns and cities come together. Zoom is probably a good vehicle for that in a way, but we've got to further our understanding. We're only going to get that through discussion and respectful, respectful discussion and the shared, and what I heard tonight was shared efforts and um, working together and and I think that, that for me, the word is that trying to create the environment where we've got respectful conversations, which I think worked really well tonight. So thank you everyone.